Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. After a three-year-old boy seemingly vanished into thin air in Kendall, New South Wales, Australia, the largest manhunt in Australian history was launched. After thousands of interviews leading to over 600 persons of interest, the case of William Tyrrell has had its share of twists and turns. Over the years, the case has seen criminal charges and lawsuits filed as different theories have taken hold. What was initially seen as a crime of opportunity took a very different turn as the years went on. Now, with police recommending new charges to be filed, people are looking at this case in a whole new light. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of William Tyrrell. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone welcome back thank you for joining us once again all right so this is one of those cases that just had so much going on that about halfway through writing it i realized it had to be a two-parter because i mean all we did last week was talk about the first year of the investigation right and you know in a lot of these older missing persons cases unfortunately like that would basically be the end of it Right. Would if cover if that. no new information yeah. came out, if it was just stalled. Right. And that's the case in many of them, right? Like, yeah. it's like a lot happens in the first, you know, days, weeks, months, and then it's just silent for years at a time sometimes. But so much has happened with this case that um, it's, yeah, I thought it would just be too confusing to shove it all into one episode. The investigation, like I said in the intro, it was the largest manhunt in Australian history. This investigation has been intense since day one, and that intensity has barely waned in the intervening years. But what was clear is that as the first year of the investigation ended, William's foster and biological parents had all been cleared, and the focus had turned to a group of pedophiles operating in the area. So what we're going to be talking about this week is how after investigating this angle, the entire investigation took a left turn. Mm, Okay. So now let's get into part two of the disappearance of William Tyrrell. Now, just to catch you up, three-year-old William Tyrrell lived in Sydney with his older sister and his foster parents. William and his sister had been removed from their biological parents' care at a young age due to domestic violence and drug issues. Due to Australia's laws, the fact that William was in foster care at the time of his 2014 disappearance wasn't made public until 2017. Still wild. I know. And it was so strange because, you know, I think the the very first thing I read about this case was the Wikipedia, the Wikipedia article. And the Wikipedia article is like, you know, William Tyrrell was with his foster parents when in New South Wales, blah, blah, blah. He went missing. And so I'm like, okay. And then I'm as I'm going through it and actually doing the research, there are like Reddit threads and stuff from 2017 that said William Tyrrell was in foster care. Like you As know, though it was a surprise. Right. When he went missing. And I was like, wait, yeah, he was. Right. What? Yeah. <laughs> and so it was very confusing for me, an American, you know, who we do not have these secrecy laws yeah to to just imagine how this was and like how crazy that would have been to find out on september 12th 2014 william and his foster family were at his foster grandmother's house in kendall new south wales the kids were playing outside when their foster mother and grandmother went inside to make tea A few minutes later, they realized they couldn't hear William anymore, so the foster mother went out to check on him, but William was nowhere to be seen. 
An intensive search commenced, but no trace of the boy was found. Something we didn't touch on. Is there is there a foster grandfather in this house as I well? I think he had passed away. Okay. A washing machine repairman who had done work at the home was suspected of being involved, as were members of a local grandparents group that had at least two pedophiles in their ranks. But neither line of inquiry led to William. The investigation went on, and William's foster parents remained in the public eye without ever revealing their identities. So after 2017, when the courts ruled that, yes, it can be made public that they're in foster care, to my understanding, they no longer had to keep their identity secret. Okay. Because at that point, like, what are they going to do? Like, what's going to happen, you know? Like, it doesn't really matter. But the foster family said that they chose to stay anonymous for the sake of the other children in their home. Of which William's sister presumably is still there. Presumably. And that's what's so frustrating. And we're really going to get into that later. Because yes, there are. And I again, I don't have dates or whatever. I believe that right after William disappeared, that his sister did stay in the home. Okay. Um, from what I understand, at least not right away or anything. She was not returned to the biological parents or anything like that. She wasn't placed in different foster care. She may have been later. Mm. And that's the that's the thing. We just don't know. But what I do know is that this family stayed in the foster care system, meaning that they took in more yes. children. I don't know when, for how long, what years, anything like that. But I do know that they continued to foster after this. Okay. And so for them, they said, well, we want to stay private because we don't want our kids to be in school and to, you know, have people come up to them and talk about this, basically. Yeah. On December 21st, 2015, the Foster family released a Christmas poem about William, which read in part, quote, it's a time when families come together and hold each other tight, but not our family and not this Christmas night, while our beautiful boy William is still missing absent from our sight, end quote. As 2015 turned into 2016 and the second anniversary of William's disappearance approached, I cannot overemphasize the amount that the foster parents remained public in their appeals for William. So they weren't doing it with their faces, with their names, you know, they weren't holding their own press conferences, but they started an incredibly detailed website called whereiswilliam.org. And I've seen a lot of websites dedicated to missing people. Mm -hmm. This is by far the most detailed one I've ever seen. Mm. They also made statements urging the public to not give up the search. On the second anniversary of William's disappearance, the New South Wales government announced a $1 million reward for information on his whereabouts, which, as I mentioned, was the largest in New South Wales history, and I think in Australian history as well. In June 2018, there was a large-scale forensic search back at the scene of the crime in the Kendall Bushland that was carried out over four weeks. They had talked to more witnesses, you know, more people, and we'll kind of get to what triggered this in a moment. Yeah. But yeah, they did a four-week search. Though police had always stated up to this point that they were searching for a missing child, this search was undertaken with the understanding that they were looking for a body. Right. It's recovery at this point. Right. Around this time, in September 2018, an inquest into William's disappearance was announced. Now, we don't have inquests here in the States, so my knowledge of them is pretty much limited to British crime dramas, Okay, but they clearly have them in Australia as well. So I'm going to apologize in advance to our Australian listeners, but from what I can gather... Yeah, what the hell is an inquest? How is that different than just the investigation? Right. Well, this is an actual court hearing. Oh, okay. But it's not a trial. Like, nobody's on trial. Okay. So no charges have been filed, and it seems as though it's a way for people to give testimony and evidence in order to aid in an investigation. Hmm. So, like, would witnesses be able to be compelled See, that's, to come forward? See, that's a good and, question. And, I actually don't know. I don't testify? know if they're compelled. I don't know if it's voluntary. I don't know about that portion of it. I do know that witnesses are able to have legal representation. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because I think it's one of those things where like anything you say in an inquest could be used against you in the future. Sure. 
yeah. even though, you know, this particular situation is again, not a trial. Nobody's charged with anything. Mm-hmm. I, like, it sound, I think the closest thing that we have to this in the States would be a grand jury, mm-hmm. but in a grand jury, there's still, still somebody have, being charged. Right. You st- yeah. Yeah. So you, it you is have a more, suspect and, and you are as the grand jury deciding whether the charges will, will go forward to court. Yeah. And so. yeah, but the grand jury is more investigational. It's more informational than the trial, right? Mm-hmm. You know, cause like in a trial, you're a lawyer, you're only asking questions that you already know the answer to. Right. And I think in a grand jury, it's more like you're really probing, really trying to figure things out. Mm-hmm. And that's what this sounds like to me. Mm. But if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, please don't leave me a bad review. I just am American. <laughs> And interestingly, when the inquest into William's disappearance happened, all of the parties, the state, the foster parents, the police, they all had representation, but the biological parents didn't. They were just thrown to the wolves. Hmm. And apparently, yeah, and apparently, like, as in, you know, a trial, like, they could have gotten state representation. You Mm. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If they like couldn't. a public defender. Right, yeah. right. Um, but nobody bothered to like tell them that or help them out with this or do anything. And, you know, the article that I read was also interesting because it was really just talking about the difference between the way that the biological parents and the foster parents have been treated throughout this entire situation, where the foster parents have been treated with kid gloves right. throughout the entire thing. Well, it's because they're wealthy. Well, exactly, right? And so and even in this inquest, it's like the questioning was very gentle. And, you know, the lawyer took them through like a five-minute testimony on how the grandma likes her tea and <laughs> things like that. Because remember, they were making tea. Yeah. And like, it's like all very like, oh, well, do you prefer your tea this way? I prefer my tea that way. Like, just very gentle and and good, which is, you know, good. Like, if you have grieving parents, you're not trying to like re-traumatize them. But the contrast between that and the way that the biological parents who were four hours away in Sydney, who were not the ones who lost William, were treated, it was very different. Like, they were much harsher With them. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, after the hearing was over, the foster parents were like quietly ushered out the back, whereas the biological parents are just thrown out the front door, like into the media scrum. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there was a lot going on. So what came of the inquest? Yeah, we'll get into all of the inquest because it was not a short process. Now, this was announced in late 2018. The inquest actually started in March 2019. But prior to this, there was a dispute with detectives within the strike force with two of the investigators, including lead investigator Jubilin, having to be physically separated so they wouldn't come to blows. Wow. Yeah, like apparently it got wild. And and it had to do, from what it sounds like, with these two detectives having very different ideas of what happened. And, you know, we go back to Bill Spedding. Right. And I have to imagine that because Jubilin was like going hard on Bill Spedding. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, we're going to charge him with these crimes. We're going to make him talk. And it sounds like maybe there's another investigator who was like, hey, maybe – slow your fucking roll a little bit. Right. And so they ended up getting into nearly physical fights over this. And this led to Jubilin stepping down from the task force. So he was the lead investigator on this case for the first four years. And then this all happened and he had to step down. Jubilin was later arrested and charged with breaches of the Surveillance Devices Act for allegedly recording conversations with persons including Kendall neighbor Paul Savage, who was a registered sex offender. So again, like that, so he does the spending thing, the spending thing kind of dies out. Then it looks like he moves on to Paul Savage, Mm -hmm. who actually lived by the grandmother's house. So if we're going back to a crime of opportunity, right, that makes more sense than a for random, sure than a random in two cars parked in a basically suburban subdivision, right? So it sounds like Jubilin 
kind of cut a few corners there Mm -hmm. and did a little bit of illegal wiretapping Mm -hmm. in hopes of getting information. Because of these charges, Jubilin ended up retiring from the police force and was later convicted and fined $10,000. Yeah, I mean, that aside, I think it probably is a good thing that he stepped off the uh, task force because he he's very it, it seems as though he, his investigation is very like he has tunnel vision gearing yeah. only towards pedophiles or these two cars and crimes of opportunity and well yeah and it's like he'll go after one when that doesn't work he'll find somebody else go after them right you know yeah which on one hand is good but then you know you're violating people's civil rights and ruining lives and, yeah right and things like that so yeah obviously and at the end of the day it's he still didn't find william right all right so this is where we seemingly figure out why that four-week search in 2018 took place because in the inquest we get testimony from a woman who said that she had been babysitting two young boys in 2018 and they told her that a different convicted pedophile a man named frank abbott told them that he had killed william and okay this is confusing because one source where I read this said that the boys had like seen Abbott burying a suitcase in the woods and then told them that William was in it. Okay. But then the article that I read about her actual testimony, it doesn't really say how this conversation came about, like how these boys knew Frank Abbott, Mm -hmm. why he would tell them that he had killed William. Right. All that it kind of says is that it's like two brothers. One is talkative. One is very silent. One was terrified. You know, the talkative brothers like, oh, yeah, Frank Abbott told us that he killed William. But if we told anybody that he would snap our mother's neck. And this babysitter said that like the other boy was terrified. And that's what made her believe them and not just like brush this off as a weird story that kids tell because like Mm -hmm. the fear that that these two little boys had, especially the one who like wasn't talking about this, she said was just felt very real to her. So she told her mother, her mother's like, you got to call the police. And that's kind of how this all kicked off and what led to this new search in 2018. So then my next question is, Frank Abbott, what's the ties to the neighborhood or the grandmother or I don't think there's any ties to the grand grandmother. I think he lives nearby, but not as close as Paul, as Paul Savage, mm-hmm. but still relatively close, like in the same general area. I don't know. It's all very, very confusing. Yeah. And so according to her testimony, again, the suitcase comes back up okay. um, and said that Abbott killed William and buried him in a suitcase. And that William, quote, was dead, but they hadn't seen the body, end quote. And so, yeah, so the investigators searched the area where Abbott had previously lived. Um, He was in jail at the time of the inquest, I think, for unrelated charges. Okay. But again, the search didn't turn anything up. The other thing that happened during this inquest is it brought the sister back into the picture. All we know about the sister up to this point is that she was also at the grandmother's house. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, the foster mom said that she she could have been the only witness. Right. Right. That's all we know about this girl so far. But in the inquest, there was a phone recording of her admitted into evidence. So basically, because she was so young, um, they didn't want to put her through the trauma of like dragging her into court. So they just allowed her to record a phone statement that was played. Gotcha. And in it, she shared an emotional plea to find her brother ending it with quote, I hope this speech makes you solve the case. If it doesn't, when I'm officially adult, I will be in the police force, a detective specifically, and I will find my brother and not give up until he's found. End quote. Which is so heartbreaking yeah um i mean because this little girl is maybe 14 at this point and and when this was this was four years ago she's so she's like 10 when she's saying this that's tough 
It is. I can't imagine, you know, you've got the early trauma of her life, mm-hmm. of being taken from her biological parents, of all the turmoil in that home, I'm, sh- you know, that I'm sure was there, to being put in this new home and, you know, having issues there, to seeing her parents, to not seeing her parents, to then having her little brother disappear. Like, I cannot imagine what this girl has gone through. But in this statement, we still don't get where she was or what she saw. No. So this inquest went on for quite a while. It was announced in 2018. It began in 2019. It went through 2020. And then I'm sure, although... The pandemic. Yeah, so I'm sure that kind of put a halt to things for a while, which is why it really spread out. The inquest findings were supposed to be released in June 2021, but they were delayed. This isn't said at the time, but it seems as though they were delayed because of new information. On September 6, 2021, just ahead of the seventh anniversary of William's disappearance, police revealed that they have been interviewing a new person of interest. A senior police officer told the Daily Telegraph that this, quote, shines a totally new complexion on what investigators believe happened to William. On November 15th, police announced a new search. They would be searching, quote, three specific locations, end quote, in the Kendall area. Detective Chief Superintendent Darren Bennett told reporters, quote, we're going to be doing some operational activity in the Kendall area over the coming weeks. We are hopeful that it will take us a degree towards providing an offense or finding out what happened to William Tyrrell. We're very hopeful that we can bring this matter to some sort of conclusion, end quote. At the end of the search, police announced that they found a bone of unknown origin. Oh. So it could be an animal bone. I mean, we honestly have no idea. And I actually, at this point, as of this recording, have not heard more about what, if anything, they found out about this bone. So they took it into testing, of course. But police finished up the search and said that it was successful. Not in finding William, obviously, but they did think that they were at least getting somewhere. On November 16th, 2021, the day after this search was announced, the case took a shocking new turn. On that day, it's reported that police had a new suspect. She could not be identified. She. Okay. Mm -hmm. But police revealed that she recently had a child removed from her custody and had an apprehended violence order taken out against her. Recently as of the investigation? Yes. Recently as of this announcement that they made in November 2021. Okay. That same day. Police were also seen digging up the garden underneath William's foster grandmother's balcony. Flowers and plants from the garden bed were being removed, and investigators analyzed the soil for evidence. It seems as though they were also using ground-penetrating radar. Now, if people couldn't guess who this new suspect was on the 16th, they definitely had it figured out on the 17th when investigators seized the car that once belonged to William's foster grandmother, who died in March of 2021. The car underwent forensic examinations to determine whether it was used to move William's body after his death. Because I'm going to get into a whole other thing, so let's talk about this. Okay, so... So grandma and mom are in on it. That's what they're saying. And obviously we're going to get into it. But yeah, they are now believing in November 2021 that William died on the property and that the foster grandmother and the foster mother worked together to cover it up. Going back to the timeline, biological father leaves around or sl- slightly after that phone call to the repairman at 9.03. Mm-hmm. And then mom doesn't call the police until 10.56. Right. Even if she, she said she started looking for William at 10.30. So even if mm-hmm. like she had um, neighbors out and about looking for William at 10.30, that still leaves almost an hour and a half. Right. 
for something to have happened yeah. and then for them to cover it up in some way, um, which isn't a ton of time, but it's not 15 minutes either, you know? Right. And so the interesting part about like the soil analyzation that I kind of thought about right away was the Kristen Smart case. In the Kristen Smart case, they searched Paul Flores's parents' yard underneath the deck right. where they believed Kristen had been buried. They did not find her, but they used ground penetrating radar and they dug and took soil samples. And what they found is that in the soil is that there had been biological believe, evidence, biological evidence, right. which they believed to have been be- due to decomposition of a body. Mm-hmm. So these are things that you can find in the soil. Right. So yeah, again, we don't know what they found, if they found anything in this case. Mm-hmm. But even if a body is not there, evidence can absolutely still be left behind even years later. Mm-hmm. Because again, when the searches were done in Kristen Smart's case, it was like 20 years later. So at this point, we are talking seven years. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is all coming out starting on November 16th. After this, like, News just starts boom, 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 coming out fast and furious. Because in a turn of events that I'm sure was not a coincidence, on November 21st, 2021, the foster parents, now both mom and dad in this case, were charged with assault of a child in a case unrelated to William. Mm. So this isn't like the police doing historical charges like they apparently like to do. These are brand new charges involving a different child. Now, this is the part that is really, I mean, all of it's really difficult. But the child we know is female. And at the time, she was 11 years old. We don't know if this is William's biological sister. Mm -hmm. But the ages... Match up. Yeah. So to think that this could potentially be William's biological sister, I just, I don't even know what to say about that. The reason why I said that the parents, the foster parents continue to be in the foster care system is because there was apparently at the time of this abuse, a six-year-old child also in the home. So this six-year-old child obviously had was not anywhere, wasn't born when William disappeared, right? So this is just a whole other separate child. So there is a possibility that this 11-year-old girl is also a whole other separate child that has nothing to do with William or anything like that. Or his sister. So I just want to make that very clear, like because of the privacy laws, because of, you know, the information that we actually have, we do not know if this is William's biological sister. So according to court documents, the foster mom said that there was a level of jealousy between these two children. What two children? The six-year-old and the 11-year-old. Okay. So, and that's kind of what, what led to this whole thing. So, so the parents are accused of abusing the 11-year-old. And what the foster mother is saying is she's like, well, there's this like level of jealousy and the 11-year-old would refuse to do her chores and refuse to do her homework and refuse to do this, that, and the other. And that's kind of what led to these incidents, I guess. That's interesting. Yeah. But then the the court, like the prosecution's like, I don't know, that sounds like normal shit that 11-year-olds do, you know, like. Yeah. Like at what point, even if that is occurring, like. Where does the abuse come in? Well, exactly. So according to an early hearing, the foster mother used a wooden spoon to hit the girl and allegedly kicked her while she was on the floor. Mm. The prosecutor told the court there is evidence the foster mother called a friend and said, quote, I need to break her, end quote. Yikes. Yeah, the couple pleaded not guilty and the case was delayed multiple times and dragged on to just a few months ago. In early 2022, both parents were charged with giving false or misleading evidence to the NSW Crime Commission. They were acquitted of these charges. On September 3rd, 2023, just about a month and a half before this recording, 
William's foster mother pleaded guilty to two counts of common assault in relation to the alleged incidents that took place in January and October 2021. All right, so this is all very confusing, but what it seems like is they were charged with giving false or misleading evidence um, and acquitted, but this is not related to William's case. It sounded, a lot of articles make it sound like it was, but it seems like this is only related to this abuse case. And it seems like they were charged with this because they said that they lied to police about what had happened about the abuse, right? Mm-hmm. There were a lot of um, recorded phone calls and things in this case, and there were questions around whether or not she did use a wooden spoon. Basically, what ended up happening is the reason she was acquitted of these charges is because basically she pleaded guilty to assaulting the child. And so I think they dropped those other charges in exchange for the plea is kind of what it sounds like. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's there are more details of the abuse that I don't really want to get into here, um, but it's bad. Like it is bad. And the this child was terrified of them. I will say that at one point, she said that the foster father had put his hands around her neck. Uh. It all seems brutal. So it does seem as though the charges were warranted. Now, they were also, she and her husband were also charged with two counts of stalking or intimidating the child. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. She has entered not guilty pleas on that. Her husband maintained not guilty pleas to one count of common assault and one count of stalking or intimidating the child. They are still facing hearings on the remaining charges. And the child in question has been removed from their care. And it's the other just horribly sad part of this is that, you know, they at least some of the the abuse has been proven. And when the child was removed from her care, their care, she, the child was like crying. And then the mom is like, well, I did something bad. So you have to leave. Like it Uh, just sounded like a terrible, terrible situation all around. Yeah. Important to note. Mm -hmm. This doesn't necessarily mean that they killed William. No, not at all. But it, adds a very interesting layer to the story. For sure. And especially because if you look back on the coverage, again, they were treated, which makes sense, right? Like it makes sense that they were treated by the media this way as horrified, grieving parents mm-hmm. who were loving and and who, you know, did everything right and had a horrible thing happen to them. Mm-hmm. So for this to come out years later just certainly puts everything in a brand new light. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it's just especially the whole like him falling. Right. Yeah. The black eye. Yeah. You know, I mean, it really makes you question things in a way that I think people weren't questioning them at the time. Mm-hmm. And then you go back to the whole foster care aspect of it. And yes, clearly his biological parents had troubles, but but weighing the two of them, yeah, you know, did these children really end up in a better place, right? And from what it sounds like, too, is a lot of the troubles, especially with the biological father, really happened after the kids were taken away from them. Mm-hmm. Because, like, it sounds like they both had issues with drinking and fighting when they were drinking, but... And take this with a grain of salt because it comes from like the father and like his mother. But, you know, according to them, like he didn't do drugs like that was not his deal at all. Uh Reporters interviewed him like several years after William's disappearance. And he and the biological mom had split up by this point. He was like homeless. He was couch surfing and he freely admitted that he had gotten bad into drugs after all of this happened. Uh Mm-hmm. So, like, their lives certainly took a downward spiral, but it's, like, how much of it would have happened had their children not been taken away from them and then their son... Goes missing. Right. Yeah. Just everything about this has such far-reaching implications for so many people. Like, so many lives were affected and, and destroyed by all of this. 
This is just so tough because it's all going back and forth. And, you know, anytime anything goes to the courts, it takes forever, right? Mm -hmm. So while all of this was going on, so like while the abuse case was kind of making its way through the course and they were charged with new charges and pleading guilty and, and et cetera, et cetera. Strike Force Roseanne provided the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP, with a brief of evidence recommending William's foster mother be charged with offenses relating to his disappearance, specifically perverting the course of justice and interfering with the corpse. The police theory is that William died in an accident and his foster mother and grandmother covered it up by hiding his body. They believe that he fell off of the upper veranda of the home. Interesting. Yeah. And so that's, it sounds like that's where they were digging basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the theory that at some point, because obviously Part of the story is is true, and we know that because of the picture that was taken, right? Right. We have William in a Spider-Man costume on the lower veranda. I was just going to ask where the picture was taken. Yeah, the lower veranda. Okay. We know he didn't fall off of that and and die. But Mm -hmm. so apparently, according to the police's new theory, at some point, he got onto this upper veranda and And fell fell off. off. So they are clear to say that they do not believe the foster mother murdered William. But then covered up his death. Right. His accidental death. Right. And so one, uh, I'm going to post this video on our blog as well, but there's an interesting kind of roundtable discussion that I saw on a news program that had like a former police investigator, not on this case, but a former police investigator. It had a reporter who's been covering this since the beginning, who like has a podcast and wrote a book about it. You know, a bunch of it's like four different people, right? Who are all talking about this. And it aired recently after these charges were recommended to be filed. And they ask a really good question, which is, okay, let's say that that is what happened. Mm -hmm. Let's say that William had some sort of accident, fell. And this is the reporter, I think, who asked this. She's like, why is your first instinct, let's hide the body? Yes, right. Not like, let's call an ambulance. Right. Yes. Why? Right. And so that that makes me wonder whether whether there had been abuse of of William, and that's the reason why they covered the body or 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 hid hid his body was because they were afraid that the evidence of the abuse would come out. Exactly. So that's exactly what they say on this show. Like that's their theory that the only reason, if it were truly an accident. Mm-hmm. That the only reason that that would your, be your reaction would be because, yeah, you were afraid that once the police get there, once the ambulance gets there, once he is taken and examined, that evidence of prior abuse will show up. And then that jeopardizes everything, obviously, right? I mean, you have a child that you're abusing who dies in your care. Mm-hmm. Charges could potentially be brought from that. You know, the other child's certainly getting removed from your home. Right. You're obviously never going to be allowed to foster any children after that. Yeah. And then, you know, who knows what would happen to their reputation, their business, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Like that could be just devastating to them on every level. So at that point, maybe the answer is let's just hide this. William's foster mother, of course, maintains that she had no involvement in William's disappearance. Her lawyers told reporters, quote, William's foster mother and foster father hold the position of calling for the disclosure of evidence, which police suggest forms the basis of criminal proceedings. She maintains she had nothing to do with his disappearance and asks the police to continue looking for William and what happened to him, end quote. So basically, she's like, oh, OK, you want to recommend that I be charged in his death? Show me the evidence. What proof do you have of this? <laughs> well, isn't, isn't, Make it public. Yeah, isn't that what? court cases i mean yeah basically but she wants the evidence or like more of it i guess shown before that because again charges have not been filed against her oh okay i thought that so they they just recommended oh my god what does that even mean 
Yeah. So I know it's like, it's tough when you get into other countries' legal yeah. systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as of this moment, as of this recording in October 2023, the only criminal charges filed against either of the foster parents is related the to the abuse of the 11 year old girl. Right. No criminal charges have been filed against them related in any way to William's disappearance. So with all of this insanity, the results from the original inquest, which you asked me a long time ago, whatever yes. happened with the inquest? Yeah. Well, those findings have continued to be delayed again because just shit keeps on happening. So if you recall, they were originally supposed to be released in June 2021, but have been delayed multiple times. The courts are supposed to decide whether or not to proceed with the recommended charges against the foster mo mother in January 2024, but the inquest is actually expected to continue in March 2024. So it sounds like they're just Jesus, going really? to keep on doing new hearings in this inquest. Holy shit. Yeah. So obviously, we're going to follow this case and keep you updated on all of that because it is far, far from over. And right now we have another three months before we could even know if charges against the mother are going to be filed or not. This is wild. It is. Yeah. And then obviously foster grandmother, nothing's filed because she passed away in 2021. Right. And yeah. And interestingly, they truly do believe that whatever happened with William happened before the foster father got back to the house because he's not named in any of this. But it makes you wonder whether he whether he knew. Yeah, like after the after, fact, yeah. right? And so I think that if they do end up filing charges against the foster mother, we could potentially see related charges. Sure. But I think there's no benefit in charging even making or, those recommendations yeah, right. for charging him now, yeah. you know? Because whatever they charge him with is going to be a much more minor crime. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. The disappearance of little William Tyrrell is a tragedy that has affected all of Australia and brought up important questions surrounding the country's foster care system. Were the foster parents given too much leeway because of their wealth and status? Conversely, were William's biological parents given too little leeway because of their lack of wealth and status? Regardless of his disappearance, should William have been rushed through the system with few efforts of reunification between him and his biological parents? And then beyond that, once you get to the case itself, what makes sense? The criminal profiler says that while it would have to be a crime of opportunity, it would be an incredibly risky one, given the rural nature of the neighborhood. So how would someone happen to come across William in this one five-minute span? Right. That's what I said. Right. Like, it's not realistic. Again, if there was, if there was like a, a neighborhood playground, some place where a pedophile could target where kids would known to be, that would be different. This is just somebody's front yard. Right. On not a busy street. Because it's one thing if it's a front yard on a street where people are constantly going back and forth and would see this child playing. Yeah. And the child doesn't even live there. Yeah. It's a dead end street too. So like you're not on the street unless you're going to one of these houses. This isn't a, a house that people pass by right. for no reason. Right. Conversely, if William did have an accident, you got to go back to the question that we just talked about, which is why is your reaction? Let's hide the body instead of let's call an ambulance, right? So like what else would have been going on there? And is it likely that that's what was going on? Because again, you know, we have the picture that was taken moments before whatever happened to William mm -hmm. and he looked perfectly fine. Right. You know, that's not to say there couldn't be hidden bruises. There couldn't be old breaks. There couldn't be things that would come up in a medical examination, but in terms of just general appearance, he looks like a happy, healthy three-year-old boy. So was this theory kind of thought up because of the abuse charges, or is this something that they had been kind of kicking that around that they were working on? Yeah. And then once the abuse allegations happened, it kind of solidified it for them. Mm -hmm. It's it's really hard to say because, you know, the other tough part about it is the investigation, granted, under a different lead, but the investigation has a history of zoning in 
right. on a person yes. and just going for it. So is that what they're doing in this case? Yeah, it's it's hard to say, but it, it, the, you got to think that if they're if they're making recommendations for charges to be made that they found something in that. Well, story. they also charged Bill Spedding with historical sex abuse charges and, and, and there was true. zero evidence. That's true. But that was also, like you said, that was a different lead investigator. Right. So yeah. we, we don't know what is going on in this case. Yeah. And you would think that after he was awarded $1.8 million that maybe they were like a little more careful. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I Yeah. I just, I don't know. And it seems to me like they, that maybe they did find something either in the soil or, or in grandma's car. Yeah. and But then I go back to why would the family stay so public for so many years just drawing attention to themselves mm. instead of receding into the background? You know, they didn't have to put up this like website, which is still up, by the way. Mm. You know, they didn't have to release a Christmas poem. Like they didn't have to do... Half of the things that they did. That's true. And and yes, like them doing nothing obviously would have looked suspicious. But like the, going they, to the other extreme is also right. So make if, sense. if they had truly had something to do with William's disappearance, like it just seems like they made themselves just way, way public and way open for public scrutiny. But then again, you get to the identity and the fact that they've hidden it for all these years without needing to. Right. Uh, it's just, I don't know. The disappearance of William Tyrrell is truly baffling. Are investigators close to answers after nine years, or are they simply hurtling down another path on which they're grasping at straws as they did with Bill Spedding? We can only hope that further hearings bring more answers in 2024, and the case of little William Tyrrell can finally be put to rest. Tyrrell has been missing from Kendall, New South Wales, Australia, since September 12, 2014. He is a white male with brown hair and hazel eyes. He was last seen wearing a two-piece Spider-Man costume. William was three years old when he went missing. He would be 12 today. Anyone with information on the disappearance of William Tyrrell is urged to call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000. There is a $1 million reward in this case. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it! <laughs>